This is one of the most exciting chapters in the book of Revelation, and no question, one of the most exciting chapters in the Bible. This is the job description of the saints for the next 50 years. And if you just recall the words that, uh, that our reader read in the last column of, you know, the last verses of Revelation chapter 14 about the judgments that are coming upon the world, you'll understand just how busy we're going to be on the one hand to bring down this colossal system of apostate mankind and on the other hand try and save people's lives who are swept up in it. An extremely difficult job. And the jo a job which is going to take some time to do, because it's not just like we can walk into the world as a butcher shop. We've got to, we've got to use uh, precision to try and save lives. And to make discernments about who is saved and who is not out of the mortal population. So there's nothing haphazard here. And in fact, there's nothing simple about this process. Particularly when you imagine that this process will, will be done amongst the seven billion inhabitants of the earth, across a period of, we're saying, 50 years. We concluded our last study like this, with the, uh, if you like, the dual timeline of the book of Revelation, and uh, highlighting the last 50 years, that is the time period between the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to judge the household and the commencement of the thousand-year reign, that is the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we illustrated that, as you'll remember, as two parallel histories, uh, one political, the other religious. And we proved that by making these scriptural links between Revelation 6 and Revelation 12 on the left-hand side and Revelation 11 and Revelation 20 on the right-hand side of those two chronologies. We found, moreover, that punctuating those historical chronologies were various kingdom visions, which we've, we've, we've pulled out of the chronologies, as you can see on the screen, visions for the saints which lived in the various epochs of that history. And then we made the point about the last 50 years, as I've just said, prior to the commencement of the millennium, and made the observation that there is an enormous number of chapters captured in that 50-year period. Chapter 11, 16, 17, 18, 19, chapter 10, as we found this morning, chapter 14, as we're going to find in a moment. Why so many chapters? Why is 30% of the book of Revelation all going to happen in the next 50 years? Well, the answer is very simple. Because this particular portion of the book of Revelation is the portion, well, it's the culmination of the plot, isn't it? It is the destruction of the 6,000-year-old kingdom of men and these enormous ferocious beasts which manifested. That brought us to an explanation of the 50 years. Now, you, you remember I made the point yesterday, or yesterday afternoon, morning, <laughs> goodness, that I had to explain to you that 50 years because we were going to have the exhortation on the seven thunders which were poured out in the last 30 of that 50 years. Now, ideally, of course, the exhortation would have been after the study, and everybody would, be, would have been very clear on that. So if for whatever reason you weren't here yesterday and missed the introduction, and then came straight into the exhortation and wondered how on earth this was all fitting into the seventh vial, uh, all being well, by the end of chapter 14, uh, you'll understand what the context of the time period was that we dealt with in our exhortation this morning. Now, let me tell you what we're going to do today. First off, we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 16 in the seventh vial where we spoke, where we left off speaking yesterday. The reason for that is because you're on familiar ground. The sixth vial concludes with the Battle of Armageddon. We've had a bit of a, a brief pracy of the seventh vial, so I think you'll be comfortable starting there because you know where you are in the chronology of history, particularly with reference to where we are today. From there... We're going to go to Ezekiel 38 and 39 because there's a quotation from Ezekiel 39 made in Revelation chapter 16 in the seventh vial. And you already know a lot about Ezekiel chapter 38. So by me going back to Ezekiel 38 and 39, once again, you're on familiar territory. And I think that will help you see how the judgment of the world is actually portrayed in Scripture. From there... We go to Revelation chapter 14, because Revelation chapter 14 is going to give you the, the minute detail 
of the seventh vial. Now you're going to say to me, having just read this, how on earth would you know that Revelation chapter 14 was going to explain the seventh vial of Revelation 16? Where would you go to, to make that assumption? That's what I'll show you. It's very clear and it's very solid. And finally, because you'll want to know, we're going to conclude by explaining the 50-year time period. Why do we say 50 years? What proof is there of 50 years, of this particular jubilee time period? So we're going to put all that together and see how it works. So if you've got a question mark about the timing, reserve it to, let's say, the last 10 or so minutes of the address this afternoon. Okay. Revelation 16. Let's begin back where we were yesterday. Revelation 16, verse 12, is the sixth vial which began in the year 1820 with the drying up of the Empire of Turkey, that is the, the Ottoman Empire. The three unclean spirits like frogs go out, so we've got the, the doctrines of the French Revolution percolating from west eastward across Europe. The purpose of those doctrines, or, or devils as they're called in verse 14, demons, is to drag the entire world to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Verse 14 of Revelation 16. That battle is called Armageddon in verse 16, and just before the battle of Armageddon, we're suggesting 10 years before, in fact, verse 15, the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And the salient point, I suppose, out of the sixth vial of Revelation 16 is the point you all know. When you see the world imminently heading towards Armageddon, understand that if Armageddon's in verse 16, Christ comes in verse 15. So if the world is no more than 10 years away from Armageddon today, in your estimation, then you should expect the Lord Jesus Christ to come tonight. You won't see Russia invade Israel before you're at the judgment seat of Christ. That's the point. Well, that much we know. Very simple. The sixth vial concludes with the Battle of Armageddon. And you can see on, it on the screen, that's ten years. That's year ten after the Lord Jesus Christ comes. What that means is that the seventh vial that commences in verse 17 and goes through to verse 21 occupies a period of 40 years. You see, from year 10 to year 50. All right, very simple. Now let's look at the detail of verses 17 to 21. Here's the seventh vial. Now the first thing to observe is that verse 17 is actually a summary of the entire process of the vial and the historical detail of how that comes about is given in verses 18 to 21. Now how do we know that? Well because at the end of verse 17 it says... Whatever this vial is going to do, it is done. It's all done by the end of verse 17. But we know from verse 19 that great Babylon only falls then. Well, the whole purpose of the seventh vial, of course, is to bring great Babylon to a, a, a destructive end. So verse 17, therefore, must be a summary of the entire vial because great Babylon's not destroyed until verse 19. Verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it's done. Now here's the first question, what's a vial? I mean, we keep talking about the vial. It's very simple, a vial is just a bowl. And this bowl of judgment is tipped into the air. And the consequence of tipping that judgment into the air results in the complete accomplishment of the purpose of God and the destruction of the beast. So what's the air? Well, the air is a symbolic term signifying the aerial region of the kingdom of men. Now, what does that mean? It means the government of the kingdom of men. It's clearly a symbolic term because there's no point in judging the air. Not, not only that, all of the other vials in Revelation 16 have judged various aspects of the Roman Empire. So you'll see in verse 2, judgment upon the earth, just in the, the second line down on your page of verse 2. He poured out his vial upon the earth. Uh, verse 3, the sea. Verse 4, the rivers. Verse, four, uh, verse 8, the sun. Verse 10, the seed of the beast. Verse 12, the river Euphrates. So the air in verse 17 is just another part of the Roman Empire. And in fact, it's the 
government of the latter day phase of the Roman Empire, that is, the European Empire. Now, if you've never heard that before, think harder because you actually have. Do you remember this little quote from Ephesians 2 verse 2? The government of this age is called the prince of the power of the air. Ah, so the government is called the prince of the power of the air. So the air is speaking of the, the governing regions of our environment, of our society. What about this one? First of Thessalonians 4 verse 17. We're going to be resurrected. We're going to be caught up in clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Where shall we ever be with the Lord? Not in the sky. In the government of the future age. You see, that's what the air is here. We're promised to be kings and priests of the future age over an everlasting kingdom. So the air is the place of government. So that's what the vial is poured out. This bowl is poured out upon the government of the latter-day phase of the Roman beast. Now, the contrast to the air is heaven. Now, look at this. In verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven. Well, what's heaven? What's the temple? Well, that's not very difficult either. The temple is the ecclesia. How do you know? Because 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16 says that we are the temple of the living God. Well, then what's heaven? Well, heaven is like the air. It's an aerial region. It's a lofty region. In this case, it's the government of the kingdom of God. Heaven is used to describe government. Air is used to describe government. When an empire falls, for example, we replace it with a new heavens and a new earth. Perhaps a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So what, what sense, therefore, do you make of verse 17? It's really very simple. The temple is the ecclesia, the heaven is the government. This is the ecclesia in government. This is Christ's government in Jerusalem. That's the temple of heaven. The air is the government of the, of the beast, the worldly government. Heaven is Christ's government in this verse. Now, in this case, all that's happening in verse 17 is that the government of the kingdom of God is pouring out its judgment on the government of the kingdom of men. So air and heaven mean the same thing, except one's godly and the other's not in this case. Uh, you could well say that the government of the kingdom of men, you could describe that as heaven as well. But it wouldn't make sense in this verse, I don't think, to say that the, that the, the temple of heaven poured out a vial upon heaven. So there's a, there's a distinction made here between heaven on the one hand and air on the other, because we're talking about two different governments. But they both mean government. The kingdom of God pouring out its judgment upon the kingdom of men. Well, the result of that, you see, is it's done. The government of the kingdom of men is destroyed. The beast is dismembered and it's killed. It's done. And, and that's why we're saying this is a summary verse, because that's the whole purpose of this vial. But here's the interesting thing. That little phrase, it is done, is a quotation from Ezekiel 39 verse 8. Put that in your margin, because we're going to have to turn that up shortly, but not just for the present. Ezekiel 39 verse 8 is where the phrase, it is done, comes from. Now, just by observation, you know what Ezekiel 38 is all about. So for me to be <laughs> pointing you to a quote, eight verses after Ezekiel 38 has completed, you will appreciate that we have just finished Armageddon and we're on to the next phase of judgment of the world by the time we get to Ezekiel 39. Now I'm going to leave it there, but you can see the immediate uh, significance of having a quotation from the early verses of Ezekiel 39 in this context. Ezekiel 38 is Armageddon, which is Revelation 16, verse 16. It is done, Ezekiel 39, verse 8. Ah, that's extremely significant. I'll stop there because we'll look at it shortly, but that's the point. And now here's the detail of how it gets done. Verse 18. There were voices, thunders, lightnings, a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. The voices, well, those voices are the proclamations of the saints. This is the mid-heaven proclamation of chapter 14, verses 6 and 7 going out. 
in the seventh vial. The thunders, well, they are the seven thunders of Revelation chapter 10, verse 4, in response to the fact that the world does not heed the mid-heaven proclamation, the judgments, the thunder judgments of Revelation 10 are poured out here. And there's a great earthquake, it says. In verse 18, there are three great earthquakes in the book of Revelation. Chapter 6, verse 12. Chapter 11, verse 13. And here, chapter 16, verse 18. And the reason, as we explained yesterday, that this earthquake is so great, greater than any great earthquake there's ever been, is because this is the complete fall of the kingdom of men. This is the utter destruction of the image of Daniel chapter 2. Now, I should just warn you, don't confuse this great earthquake with the earthquake of Zechariah chapter 14. Do you remember, just before the Battle of Armageddon, the Lord Jesus Christ stands on the Mount of Olives, it cleaves in two, creates a plain 40 miles wide, and it is a literal great earthquake. There's no question. Perhaps the greatest earthquake there's ever been in the history of the world. That's a literal earthquake. This is a political earthquake. It happened sometime after the Battle of Armageddon, in fact, in year 50. Don't confuse them, they're not the same, and they don't happen at the same time. And one's literal besides, and the other is figurative, a political great earthquake. Well, here's why it's a great earthquake. Verse 19, the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came up in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of God's wrath. And we, we made the point yesterday that the reason the great city was divided into three parts is because that great city Babylon is the empire of the kingdom of men, the latter day phase, the, the iron and clay phase of Daniel chapter 2. But in the language of the book of Revelation, it's described as three individual parts. Verse 13, a dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. That is the military the economic and the religious aspects of that kingdom. Now, you might look at me as I first looked when I read that as an explanation and thought, really? Is that really the answer to, to, to the, the, the three parts of Great Babylon? Do we have any precedent to help us there? And in fact, yes, we do. I'll just offer this to you in case you've, you find that a... Less than convincing explanation of the three thirds of the of Great Babylon. Come back with me just for a moment to Daniel, sorry, to Revelation chapter eight. Revelation chapter eight is the first four trumpets, and those trumpets, those first four trumpets, were on a third of the Roman Empire. And if you haven't done it, it's a good exercise to do, beginning in verse seven and running all the way to the, to, through to verse twelve. The word third. Third, 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 third occurs all the way through those verses. And verse 12 is a classic example. The fourth angel standed and the third part of the sun was smitten. The third part of the moon. The third part of the stars. So as the third part was darkened. You see? Well, here is the judgment on a third part of the Roman Empire. And in the days in which these judgments occurred, the Roman Empire was culturally divided into three thirds. So my point is... Well, that's not therefore such a surprise that when you come to Revelation 16, Great Babylon could be divided into three thirds as well a religious, a military, and an economic dimension. Very simple. Hopefully, very simple. Verse 20 And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Mountains and islands are empires and nations. So, of course, when the judgments of God start to pour out upon Europe, Everybody runs for cover, don't they? Everybody runs for cover. Verse 21, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. And so here are the judgments poured out upon the world. And as I said to you this morning, I think the hail, the plague of hail, I mean, I've read various explanations of this, but I think the plague of hail is literal. In Ezekiel 38, for example, and in verse 22, I will plead with God, sorry, with Gog, says God, with pestilence, blood, rain, fire, brimstone, hailstones. 
So the natural elements are used to defeat Gog in the Battle of Armageddon in Ezekiel 38. Why wouldn't they be used to discipline Europe and to destroy the beast in the second great phase of divine judgment? But this is interesting. I'll show you something. You see in verse 21 of Revelation 16, hail out of heaven. Uh, Look at uh, verse 2 of Revelation 16. Swords, or as the word means, boils. Verse 4, blood. Verse 10, darkness. Verse 13, frogs. Now, where have you read all those words before? Well, of course, they are the plagues of Egypt. They were the plagues that were used to discipline an empire once upon a time. Lo and behold, we've got the very same things, the same, the very same things being poured out in the vials, the successive vials of Revelation chapter 16. God hasn't changed. You see, he uses natural elements to discipline the kingdom of men over and over again. And so, as I say, I think the seven thunders of Revelation chapter 10 will in fact be like seven Egyptian plagues. There are seven military campaigns of, Egypt, of, day, of the greater than David, no doubt. But they will be seven, I believe, natural plagues, uh, miraculous natural plagues, uh, ushered into the world to discipline it and to try and turn its direction from the apostasy and the iniquity that it currently pursues. And what What will the saints do once the world is brought to heal and the beast is destroyed? Well, we'll think about it in the words of Revelation 15. Look at this in verse 2 of Revelation 15. I saw, as it were, a sea of glass, so there's the nations now subdued, mingled with fire. So they're still licking their wounds from the judgment that's come upon them. Fire meaning judgment. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. There's the saints having disciplined the world. And what do they do? They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvellous are thy works, quoting Exodus chapter 15. They sing the same song that Moses and his people sang when they crossed the Red Sea after the ten plagues had judged Egypt. You see, it's enormously parallel in Revelation 16 to what happened, what, three and a half thousand years ago when another empire was judged by God. So you could say that in uh, an allegorical sense, the destruction of Great Babylon, of verse 19 of Revelation 16, is really just the destruction of a latter-day Sodom and Egypt by plagues. So there's the big picture. That's what happens in the seventh vial. Now let's talk about this interesting little detail from Ezekiel. Come back with me to Ezekiel 39. Now our point, of course, don't forget, is that Revelation 16 and verse 17 quotes Ezekiel 39 verse 8. So now let's come back to Ezekiel 39. I'm not going to tell you anything about Ezekiel 38 because you know you You know your Ezekiel 38 pretty well. What I will tell you is this, though. The chapter break's not really in a very good place at the end of Ezekiel 38. The first five verses of Ezekiel 39 are really a continuation of Ezekiel 38. How do we know? Well, because Ezekiel 39 verse 1 says, Therefore, thou son of man, Ezekiel, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith Adonai Yahweh, I'm against thee. O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Identical words, actually, to chapter 38, verse 3. So so Ezekiel 39 here is continuing its judgment upon the Gogian hordes. But when you come to Ezekiel 39, verse 6, a new section begins. And we've got a new target in Ezekiel 39, verse 6. In addition to judging Gog and destroying him upon the mountains of Israel in Ezekiel 38, when you come to chapter 39, verse 6, it says, And I will send a fire upon Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, or as as it ought to be, carelessly in the coastal regions. I'm not talking about the British isles, for example. 
those who dwell carelessly in the coastal regions. And they shall know that I am Yahweh, he says in verse 6. And then verse 8, Behold, it is come, and it is done, saith Adonai Yahweh. This is the day whereof I've spoken. And you'll notice in verse 8, the little T taking you in your margin to Revelation 16, verse 17. So there's the quotation that John makes in Revelation 16 of Ezekiel 39, verse 8. Now, what's the point? Oh, my technology is going to hopefully keep up with me. Why have we turned to this? For this region, for, for this reason. The overthrow of the kingdom of men is done in two stages. In the context of Ezekiel, we have the destruction of Gog at Armageddon, a, a, a short, limited duration battle in Ezekiel chapter 38. As soon as that's done, we have a judgment upon Magog, Catholic Europe, in Ezekiel chapter 39. You see? First is the battle of Armageddon, then there's the cleansing of Europe. That's how Ezekiel portrays it. Armageddon's a short conflict, or relatively short. The cleansing of Europe, or Mago, is a substantially longer protracted conflict. As far as the seventh vial is concerned, it begins with the Battle of Armageddon, or at least the sixth vial ends with the Battle of Armageddon, and the seventh vial ends with the fall of Great Babylon. Year 10 and year 50. Well, Ezekiel 38 is what happens in year 10, and Ezekiel 39 is what happens up to year 50. Let me show you. Why, why is it important to understand that? Well, you come back to Revelation 16. I'll show you why. And now I'm going to show you how Revelation 16 links with Revelation chapter 14. This is now the detail of Revelation 16 as it's explained in Revelation 14. The world is subdued by means of two great battles. The Battle of Armageddon, which is a short-term battle, and the fire upon Magog, or the cleansing of Europe, which is a long-term battle. In fact, I would suggest to you that the cleansing of Europe, Europe is none other than the seven thunders of Revelation chapter 10. But let me show you that clearly. So look, look at Revelation 16, verse 16. Here's the battle of Armageddon. That's Ezekiel 38. Now run across the page to your left and look at Revelation 14 and verse 15. Another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, and he said... Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now the harvest of the earth, well, you see halfway through verse 15 where it says, Thrust in thy sickle, and you've got a little marginal note there by that L, Joel 3, verse 13. What does Joel 3, verse 13 say? Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. And what's Joel 3.13 talking about? <coughs> Why? The Battle of Armageddon. And so you could, you could take your coloured pencil, therefore, and you could colour in the word Armageddon in chapter 16, verse 16, and you could colour in the phrase, for the harvest of the earth is ripe, in chapter, 5, uh, chapter 14, verse 15, and link them together. Because there's the battle of Armageddon being spoken about in Revelation 16 and in Revelation 14. You see? Very simple. What about this one? Chapter 16, verse 19. The great city was divided into three parts. The cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God. Why? To give her, to, sorry, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now run across the page and take a look at chapter 14, verse 19. The angel thrust in his sickle to the earth and gathered the, the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So you could colour in the phrase, the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, in chapter 16, verse 19. And you could go across the page to chapter 14, verse 9, and colour in the phrase, 
wine press of the wrath of God, and you could link those two things together, there's the judgment upon Magog. We've got Armageddon, which is Ezekiel 38. We've got the, the, the wine of God's wrath, which is Ezekiel chapter 39. Now, one last thing to show you. In Revelation 14, and then I'm going to bring all this together for you. In Revelation chapter 14, you see in verse 15, this little phrase at the end of the verse, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's a reference to Armageddon. And what we're saying is that in the language of Revelation 14, Armageddon is called the harvest of the earth. That's all I want to say about that. It's just called the harvest of the earth. And in verse 19, the judgment upon Magog, the cleansing of Europe, that's called, you see the little phrase halfway through the verse, the vine of the earth? It ought to be, in fact, translated the vintage of the earth. So the cleansing of Europe is called the vintage of the earth. Now, these are big words. What are we saying? The Battle of Armageddon is like harvesting grain, and the cleansing of Europe is like crushing grapes. That's really all we're saying. But in the words of Revelation 14, Armageddon's the harvest of the earth, the cleansing of Europe is the vintage of the earth. Now, I'm laboring the point. Why am I doing it? Here's why. Here's how it fits into the 50 years. Look, year 10, we have the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation 16, or the destruction of Gog, Ezekiel 38, or the smiting of the image, Daniel 2, or the harvest of the earth, Revelation 14. And then from year 20 to 50, which are the seven thunders that you read of in Revelation chapter 10, we have the fall of great Babylon, Revelation 16, or fire upon Magog, Ezekiel 39, or the grinding to powder of Daniel's image, Daniel 2, or the vintage of the earth, Revelation 14. You see? It looks like I've got a mistake there. I've got fire upon Magog, Ezekiel 39, 1 to 6. It should be Ezekiel 39, verse 6 to 8. I'll change that on my copy. You might like to change it upon yours. The second line down on stage 2. And uh, can you see across the very top of the screen the sixth vial and the seventh vial? Can you see that the seventh vial begins and ends in war? It begins with the Battle of Armageddon in year 10, and it concludes with the conclusion of stage 2, the vintage of the earth, the destruction of the beast, and the cleansing of, the Europe, of Europe in year 50. Can you see that? So the seventh vial of Revelation 16, verses 17 to 21, begins and ends in war. One's called the smiting of the image, the other's the grinding of it to powder, and those other parallels that you see on the screen. And can you see we've now linked Revelation 16 directly to Revelation chapter 14? I hope that's clear. It's very clear to me. I hope it's clear to you. What have we said? Point one, the seventh vial compasses a 40-year period in terms of our timeline from year 10 to year 50. Point two, there are two major conflicts in the seventh vial. Well, I'm going to say it like this. The first is the Battle of Armageddon, which is really the last thing in the sixth vial, but it begins the seventh vial, if you like, in year 10. And the second conflict is the destruction of the beast and the cleansing of Europe. They are called the harvest of the earth and the vintage of the earth. You'll appreciate that the Battle of Armageddon is a very short-term battle, might happen in one year, whereas the cleansing of the Europe is a far more difficult thing to perform. It takes a period of 30 years, which we believe are the seven thunder judgments, the plague thunder judgments, you might say, of Revelation chapter 10, years 20 to 50. Simple? Okay. Now, here's an observation for the careful readers amongst us. Look hard now at these last verses of Revelation 14. In this section, in Revelation 14, you'll see in, in verse 15, another angel. Now, we've got another angel in verse 15. We've got another angel in verse 17. And we've got another angel in verse 18. 
And those angels all come from different places. It says in verse 15 that the angel came out of the temple. But it says in verse 17 that the second angel here came out of the temple which is in heaven. Okay, now here's my hard question. What's the difference between coming out of the temple and coming out of the temple in heaven? And when you answer this question, it will prove everything we've just said. All right, what's the temple? The temple is the ecclesia. So in verse 15 of Revelation 14, we've got an angel comes out of the ecclesia. And in verse 17, the temple in heaven. What's the temple in heaven? Ah, it's the ecclesia in government. Can you see, therefore, that by the time you get to verse 17, the ecclesia is in government, which means Christ's throne is established in Jerusalem, because that's where the government of the future age is going to be. And therefore, that verses 17 to 20 is all happening when Christ is enthroned in Jerusalem. But verse 15, at the Battle of Armageddon, is not from the ecclesia in government, because Christ does not set up his government until he... until he takes the city of Jerusalem, which doesn't happen until after he destroys Gog at Armageddon. You see what we're saying? Look, really clear. Christ's government doesn't really start until year 11, or something like that. Because he's got to destroy Gog, liberate the city of Jerusalem from Gog, and then he can establish his government upon the ancient throne of David in Jerusalem. So when an angel in verse 15, comes out of the temple and thrusts in his sickle to reap the harvest of Armageddon, of course he doesn't come from the temple in heaven because Christ hasn't yet set up his government in Jerusalem. But when you come to purge Magog in verses 17 to 20, we're here. Well, of course, Christ has set up his government in Jerusalem in year 11. Now, I'm just assuming Armageddon takes a year, but you pick a date. Sometime after year 10.0. The temple is no longer the temple, but it's the temple in heaven. And so you see, verse 15 is Armageddon. And verses 17 to 20 is sometime after Armageddon. Let me ask you this. What does that government in heaven look like? So Christ takes Jerusalem. He establishes the throne of David. He's now ruling from the city of Jerusalem. The little stone is going to grow and fill the entire earth. What does that look like? Well, I'll show you. Verse 1, Revelation 14. I looked, he says, and lo, the la- a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Christ is in possession of Jerusalem in Revelation 14, verse 1. He's just taken it off Gog at the Battle of Armageddon. He now controls Mount Zion. There is the government, uh, the, the saints in government. There is the temple in heaven, in Revelation 1, 14 and verse 1. How do we know? Well, look, verse 3. The saints are singing, as it were, a new song before the throne. Whereabouts are they singing it? You're going to say to me, well, they're singing it on Mount Zion. It says so in verse 1. Yes, yes. But that's not all it says. Look at verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters They're singing it from Mount Zion in heaven because they are in the government of Mount Zion, you see. That's what's happened here. But now we've got a problem. Because what that means is that Revelation 14 verse 1 happens after Revelation 14 verse 15. So now we've got a problem trying to work out the structure of Revelation 14. Why am I saying that Revelation 14 verse 1 happens after Revelation 14 verse 15? Well, because Revelation 14 verse 15 is speaking about the Battle of Armageddon. In Revelation 14 verse 1, Christ is already in Jerusalem. Well, that's after Armageddon, because he conquers Jerusalem at the Battle of Armageddon. What that means is Revelation 14 is not entirely in order. Do you see that? How do we solve that problem? Well, here's the clue. Take your coloured pencil again and do this. 
Chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked and lo. Chapter 14, verse 14. And I looked and behold. And the chapter splits into two halves, you see. Verses 1 to 13 are chronological. Verses 14 to 20 are two appendices on the end of the chapter. And this is how Revelation 14 breaks out. Verses 1 to 5, the 144,000 with the Lamb on Mount Zion, the temple in heaven, Christ and the saints in government in Jerusalem, David's throne re-established. Let's call it year 11 on our timeline. The Midheaven Proclamation goes out, years 10 to 20. The world must submit to the reign of Christ in order for that little stone to grow and encompass the entire earth. Well, the world doesn't submit. Ooh, verse 8. So Rome is destroyed. The city of Rome in Italy is destroyed. But that, even that doesn't do it. So verses 9 to 11. Fire upon Magog. The seven thunders of Revelation 10 are poured out as seven military campaigns, or if you like, seven great plagues. They bring the nations to heal and destroy the, the beast system, resulting, verse 12 and 13, in the triumph of the saints and the rest of the, that is the millennial rest, the, the cessation of labour of the next thousand years. And we have two appendices. Verses 14 to 16, the battle of Armageddon, the harvest of the earth. And the second appendix, verses 17 to 20, the vintage of the earth, the cleansing of Europe. Why do we have those two appendices in Revelation 14? Because the seventh vial begins and ends in war. And the first war is the battle of Armageddon, appendix one. And the second war, the concluding war, is the vintage of the earth, appendix two. You see, that's the structure of Revelation 14. And that's how Revelation 14 supplies the detail of the seventh vial of Revelation chapter 16. Simple, huh? All right. Revelation 14 verse 1. Oh, let me show you this too. We'll come to verse 1. Let's go to the next step and put all that on a timeline. Now, that might look like a lot on the screen. It's not very hard. Just look at it carefully with me. If I was to take Revelation 14 and split those verses up across 40 years, from year 10 to year 50, that's what they would look like. Now, I haven't yet done it, young people, but I'm going to do it. Mark that into my margin in Revelation chapter 14. Look, the first thing that happens in year 10, verses 14 to 16, the Battle of Armageddon. Year 11, or something like after year 10, just after year 10, verses 1 to 5, the Lamb on Mount Zion. Christ has conquered the city of Jerusalem. Then, 10 years here, the Midheaven Proclamation from year 10 to year 20. Then the fall of Rome, verse 8, Revelation 14, in year 20. Then the judgment of Europe. And that's explained twice, verses 9 to 11, and the second appendix, Verses 17 to 20. And it concludes in year 50 with the rejoicing of the saints. Now you might say to me, whoa, hang on, hang on. How do you know? How do you know that verses 9 to 11 are parallel with verses 17 to 20? So, well, that's very easy. Look at verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. That's exactly the language of verse 19. The vintage of the earth. That's the language in verse 10 of the vintage of the earth. So you see, verse 10 is directly parallel to verse 19. No problem. That's what it is. That's how Revelation 14 breaks up across the last 40 of the 50-year period. Verse 1. I looked in lower lamb, stood on Mount Zion, with, and with them 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. 144,000 is not a literal number. The word thousand in Judges 6 and verse 15 is translated families. So we could read this as 144 families, or better, 12 times 12 
families. Twelve is the number of Israel. So 144,000, therefore, is the collective number, if you like, of the entire Israel of God. This is the divine family on earth, if you like. They sing a new song, verse 3, before the throne. What is the new song? What is the new song? Well, saying before the throne and before the beasts that they have been redeemed from the earth, these 144,000. Well, it's not really a new song, actually, because you read the words of that new song way back in Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, that they have been, been, been redeemed by the blood of Christ and made kings and priests on the earth. I mean, it's hardly new, because we even might sing that song today. So in which way would you call this a new song? Well, you might like to take a note of John 3, verse 34. Jesus said at that time, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Now, it wasn't a new commandment to love one another. It was a pretty old commandment from Leviticus chapter 19. But the difference was, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. You keep the old commandment in a new way. They simply sing an old song in a new way because they're now immortal. It's one thing for us to sing the words of Revelation chapter 5. It's a very different thing to sing those words when you no longer have the encumbrance of sin, when you no longer need to sleep at night. You can see an old song, in fact, in a new way, called here, as a consequence, a new song. Verse 5, in their mouth was found no guile. Why is that? Because they are now, these saints are copies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of him we read in 1 Peter 2.22, no guile was found in his mouth. And they are without fault before the throne of God. Now the saints, of course, aren't inherently faultless. None of us is inherently faultless. But this is the fulfillment of Jude 24. Jude verse 24 says... And to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. We are not without fault, but we are presented without fault. That is to say, we're not inherently without fault. We are now, in verse 5, because we're immortal. But we are made like that in fulfillment of Jude, verse 24. And then verse 6. I saw another angel. The word another is not there, actually. There are no other angels at this point. I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven. He's got the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now, I'm not going to spend too long on this because we did deal with it somewhat this morning. This is what's called the everlasting gospel. It is not a reference to the promises to Abraham. It's not a reference to the conventional gospel message which we use today. It's the everlasting gospel. That is... The gospel of the age. That is the gospel of the kingdom age. And that gospel is given to you in verse 7. That gospel says, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. And perhaps you already have in your margin there a link between verse 7 and Revelation 10 verse 6. Perhaps you have a link between Revelation 14 verse 6 kindred tongue people, and Revelation 10, verse 11. The everlasting gospel goes out to the, to the uh, nations of the world. It's called here the mid-heaven pro uh, proclamation, or the gospel in the midst of heaven. What does that mean? What's heaven? Heaven is government. Which government is this, being pre this gospel being preached into? The government of the beast. It's being preached into the government of the beast. This is where it says here, an angel flew in the midst of heaven having that gospel. It's a parallel verse to Revelation 16, verse 17. He poured out his vial into the air. Same thing as heaven, if you like. What does that mean in practical terms for you and me? It means that we're going to have to go to the governments of the world and give them the summons of the Lord Jesus Christ. The saints may well have to demonstrate their authority by miracles in the same way that Moses went before Pharaoh and was required to prove his authority. But understand, this is what Brother Thomas says about this gospel. 
The proclamation in mid-heaven is Pentecostian, not judicial and vengeful. This gospel is an appeal. It's not a sentence. It's an appeal for the nations to submit. It announces the approach of judgment impending. It warns of the coming seven thunders. Not an actual manifestation. And therefore invites a return to God as the condition of liberty or escape from the wrath to come. So it's a warning. But it's, well, in some ways you might say, it's a threat of imminent judgment. But it is a, a, an attempt to convert the nations rather than bludgeon them into submission. I mean, the plagues will certainly do the, uh, the punitive part. But this is an appeal to the nations. Well, begs the question, really, from people like us. Fear God, give glory to him. What would happen if we, for example, were asked by John, who may well be running this preaching campaign, the apostle, to go back to Adelaide, Australia, and to preach to the people in Adelaide, Australia, to fear God and to give glory to him? Would, here's the personal question, would our worldly acquaintances be surprised to hear us saying things like that in that day? Would it be especially evident to them that, of course, it's Brother Neville Clark that's going to come and tell that to me because he's always talked like that. He's always talked about these things about to happen. Or would they say, well, how about that? Where did you come from? You wouldn't have thought you'd hide your light under a bush. There's a bit of soul searching here, really, isn't there, in verse 7, about just how consistent we are with this message now because... We made the point this morning, if this is not our message now, if this is not our character now, you can be certain we won't be doing that then. Well, what does the world think of that message? Well, you don't know. All you know is what happens in verse 8. There followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The nations are too drunk to respond. They are comatosed by the doctrines of Rome and their allegiances and their cultural heritages. They don't want to hear that they should become spiritual Jews. They are Catholics through and through and intend to remain so. Wallop, verse 8, up in flames goes the city of Rome. So we have now removed the administrative centre of the Catholic Church. We've destroyed it. Now that's almost like a shot across the bow of the beast, isn't it? I mean, that, that hardly destroys the beast. One city has been destroyed. But it was the eternal city, you understand. It was the capital city of this empire, you understand. I mean, Russia has already been dismembered in the Battle of Armageddon. This is what's left. This is what stops the world repenting. And Rome is destroyed in verse 8. And then a third angel follows in verse 9 saying with a loud voice, Now understand, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And you'll notice the verbal parallel between verse 10 and verse 8. Babylon made the nations drunk with her wine. If you persist in drinking that liquor, the angel says, then you'll drink this as well, the wine of the wrath of God, he says. Well, they drink it because they won't respond. And verse 11 says, The spoke of their torment is sent it up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and who receive the mark of his name. Plague after plague after plague comes upon them because they will not respond. Oh, they, they say they will respond. They pretend to respond, I suppose, like Pharaoh did. But the moment the, moment the saints back is turned, they change their mind. And so the next plague, the next thunder judgment has to be ushered in across that 30-year period until year 50. Well, that's where we've got to. And my time's not on my side, but I'm just going to beg another five minutes because the burning question is, all right, that's fine. How long will all of this take? Now, this is... Uh, how long will all of this take? <laughs> <laughs> not very long here are the time periods I'm going to show you three time periods 50 year jubilee 
I'm going to give you one quote on that. Very simple. 40 years for the regathering of Israel. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes on that. I'm going to put them on the screen, not turn them up. You've got them in front of you. Very simple. 30 years, one hour with the beast. Very complicated. And uh, for those of you who haven't been uh, done much study on time periods of the book of Revelation, you know what? For five minutes, your eyes might glaze over. I'll tell you what you have to know at the end. Okay. The Jubilee period. Why a Jubilee period? Well, you know, Leviticus 25 verse 10 says, You shall hallow the 50th year. You should proclaim liberty throughout all the land to the inhabitants thereof. It will be a Jubilee for you, and you return every man to his possession and every man to his family. So in the Jubilee year, the land was returned to the families who owned it, and everyone returned back to their land. Why do we say there's a Jubilee or a 50-year period? It is an educated guess based on the most likely scenario. There is, so this is Brother Thomas's view. There is no, really, no more solid quote than that, I don't believe, to suggest the Jubilee period. Except that we must allow 40 years for the regathering of Israel. And beyond that, we've got to have the judgment of the saints, the marriage of the Lamb, the subjugation of the Arab nations. That's not the work of a moment. So we need, we need another time period, a little bigger than 40 years, to encompass all this work. Well, the Jubilee is the next biggest time period. And there's a certain appropriateness about that, you see, because the land returns to the nation at uh, the year of Jubilee. And having been out of the nation for hundreds and hundreds of years, regathered Israel will very probably return at a jubilee. You see, there's a certain appropriateness about that. Well, all right, how long will it take to regather Israel? Well, Micah chapter 7, verse 15 says, According to the days of thy coming out of Egypt will I show unto him marvellous things. So you might look at Micah chapter 7 and say, well, the, the second exodus is going to be very much like the first exodus. It took 40 years the first time, and it'll take 40 years the second time. Well, that's a legitimate reading of Micah, but it's not the only reading. You could, however, read Micah to say, oh, the, the, the events which uh, happened in the first exodus will be the same sort of events that happened in the second, but not the same time period. Yes, yes, but then how do you overcome Ezekiel 20? I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face, like as I plead with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. In fact, it's all the way through Ezekiel 20, the word wilderness occurs. It, the second exodus is a direct parallel with the first exodus. And let's be frank. Why do you suppose it would take less than 40 years to convert the Jews of our day when it took 40 years to convert the Jews of Moses' day? And why do you suppose it would take less than 40 years to convert the Gentiles if it takes 40 years to convert the Jews? People don't change in a heartbeat, do they? We're talking about people, the world having entrenched positions on their view, on, on the existence of God, on the relevance of the Lord Jesus Christ as a Messiah. That is not the work of a moment. So 40 years, therefore, would appear to be a reasonable time period. And now 30 years. And this is the more difficult time period here. 30 years or one hour with the beast. In Revelation 14, there are no time periods given except for verse 7. And the Midheaven Proclamation says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. So the Midheaven Proclamation warns of an hour of judgment. Now you might look at me and say, well, it's like the hour of Christ's death, or uh, the hour of this or that event, a figurative term. You couldn't make anything of that. Well, yes, but you come across the page, two pages, to Revelation 17 and 18. The fact is that this phrase, hour, now keeps cropping up all the way through these chapters. Revelation 17, verse 12, last couple of lines. They receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. Revelation 18, verse 10, for in one hour, Babylon's judgment has come. Revelation 18, verse 17. In one hour, so great riches has come to naught. End of Revelation 18, verse 19. In one hour, she's made desolate. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, that's a biblical time. Period. That's not just uh, a general epoch of time. That's a specific time period. Well, what do we do with that? 
Well, we invoke what we call the day-for-year principle. I mean, it's, it's nonsense to say, in one hour, you know, Revelation 17, verse 12, the kings will, will, will have uh, power one hour with the beast. Uh, Parliament can't even hardly convene a session in one hour, let alone kings of the world have power with an empire of the world for an hour. It's clearly a, a biblical time period, which we've got to interpret. Well, here's the day for year period. It simply is based on a number of quotations or precedents from the Old Testament. The, the, the classic one is Numbers 14. The nation, the, the, the uh, 12 spies went into the land for 40 days. Ten of them brought back an evil report. That convinced the bulk of the nation, so they were destined to wander in the wilderness 40 years. One year for every day the spies were there. There's the basis of one day becoming one year. All right, now let's talk about an hour. How do, what, do you, what do you get if you convert an hour using the day for year principle? Well, one hour is a twelfth of a day based on the Jewish day in John 11 verse 9, which has 12 hours in it. So one hour is a twelfth of a day. Well, a twelfth of a day becomes a twelfth of a year. Well, a twelfth of a year is a month. So if you take one hour and you convert it using the day for year principle, you get one month. One twelfth of a day becomes one twelfth of a year, which is one month, or 30 days. And here's the trick. We convert it again. We, use, we, we convert that one hour a second time. One hour becomes 30 days. 30 days becomes 30 years. So that's why we say one hour equals 30 years. At this point, even if you haven't followed what I said, your eyes might glaze over and you say, I'm a bit uncomfortable about... Look, he's doing it. A bit uncomfortable about using a double conversion. All right, I accept what you say, brother. Day for year, we can convert 10 years to... Or 10 days to 10 years. Yes, yes. But twice... Okay, here are all the time periods of the book of Revelation. The reason we do sometimes two conversions, sometimes one conversion, sometimes no conversions, is based on this thing called the decorum of the symbol. Here's the rule. Whenever you read ours or parts thereof in the book of Revelation, you convert twice, without exception. Wherever you read days, you convert once. Without, well, with one exception. In um, Revelation 11, verse 9, you've got a bit of a complication there with the witnesses. But apart from that, you convert once. Whenever you read years in the book of Revelation, like 1,000 years, you do no conversion at all. So there's the rule. Hours convert twice. Days convert once. Years do not convert at all. All right. At least we're consistent. Ah. At least we're consistent. Why? Why is this happening? And here's the answer that Brother Thomas gives, which in fact many other commentators before him gave as well. It's the decorum of the symbol. Now, what does that mean? It means that the time, if you want to use a certain symbol in Revelation to describe something, and you want to, pardon me, you want to have a time period attached to that symbol, the time period's got to be consistent with the symbol. Here's Brother Graham Pierce in Revelation, which interpretation, page 68. If the symbol is an earthquake, then the time element is appropriate to earthquakes. And the same hour, there was a great earthquake in Revelation 11, verse 13. It would be inappropriate to have a symbolic earthquake for, say, a year, because earthquakes don't last that long. Well, what if you want to have the earthquake, uh, to, you, want to, you want to use a symbol of an earthquake, and you want, it to, you want to make that cover 300 years? Huh, you might have to convert twice to get to 300, you see, because you insist on using the symbol of an earthquake. If ravaging wild beasts are the symbol, then a time period of 1,260 days is appropriate. It would be incongruous to have a wild beast active for 1,260 years, which is in fact the time period you want to say. Why? Because beasts just, just don't live 1,260 years. There you are. The reason we sometimes convert once or twice depends on what symbol we're using compared with what ultimate time period we want to get to. But the rule is never broken. Down here, 
One hour converts twice, or par parts of hours convert twice. Days convert once, and years don't convert at all. Now, I was sitting at the picnic yesterday, and a brother said to me, what do you make of Revelation chapter 20? When it says a thousand years, why wouldn't you convert that, that thousand years, using a day-for-year principle, when you convert everything else using a day-for-year principle? And I gave him some answers, and I said, you know what? I'll write it down for you. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this because you've got a copy. But here's the point. I'll just go a couple, a couple of them. The thousand years is repeated all the way through Revelation 20, half a dozen times. Like, it's repeated, thousand years, thousand years, like this. There's got to be a significance there. This is the only prophecy or the only time period in Revelation which is given solely in years. So that means Revelation 20 is unique compared with the other chapters. All other references to a thousand years in Scripture are to literal years. In fact, all other prophetic time periods which are given in years in Scripture are interpreted literally. And you can see my examples. If you did use the day for year conversion in Revelation 20 of the thousand years, it would become 360,000 years, which is, well, a hundred times longer than any other biblical time period in the Bible. What's more, a thousand-year kingdom fits well with the 7,000-year plan. And finally, the millennial interpretation of Revelation 20, in fact, was accepted by the early church fathers until the church became firmly established under Constantine. And when Constantine established the Catholic Church, they decided that the kingdom was the church. The last thing they wanted to contemplate was a thousand-year kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth. Out goes that idea. So it's very simple. The shorter the time period you're given in Revelation, the more likely you are to convert multiple times. Hours convert twice, days convert once, and years don't convert at all. Come and see me later if I've gone through that. How we go, Cook? Oh. <laughs> Let's finish. <laughs> the result of all of that. <laughs> At least she's honest, right? <laughs> the result of all of that is Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints, they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Verse 12 of Revelation 14, in fact, answers the last words of verse 10 of Revelation 13. Under the persecution of the beast, the saints were required to be patient and endure. Well, here's the payback for their patience. They have now destroyed the beast in Revelation chapter 14 and established their rest for the next thousand years. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, do you see the power of Revelation 14? This is the job description for the saints for the next 50 years. We're going to bring down the entire empire of the kingdom of men, economically, religiously, militarily. Babylon gave them wine to drink and made them utterly intoxicated. We, in return, will feed them the wine of the wrath of God for their trouble. It's an enormous task. These beasts are powerful creatures. They are obstinate creatures. They're entrenched in what they believe. But there's the job. And as the psalmist says in Psalm 149, this honour hath all his saints.